Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michael Kessler, the Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. I'm a faculty member in the Government Department and the Law Center. You're not here to listen to me, but let me introduce this uh, wonderful event for a second. Christians in American Public Life, Confronting Controversies and Cultivating Common Ground. That's the title that we have for what started out as a conversation ostensibly around Melissa Rogers' new book, Faith in American Public Life. Um, this came about through multiple conversations that different people had at various points. Um, I was most proximate to one with E.J. Dion and Melissa, and we thought, let's have a conversation about this wonderful book that has a very ambiguous, wonderfully ambiguous title. <laughs> Who's public? Faith in American public life? The faithful in American public life? All of the above, including questions about what are the limits and what are the possible challenges for the faithful in American public life? What are the wonderful opportunities for partnerships with various publics? Melissa has a line in the book that deals a, a lot with the law. While the Constitution prohibits government-backed religion, it protects the rights of religious individuals and organizations to promote their faith. These principles have allowed freedom and faith to flourish in the US but there's all kinds of questions that we, that we know well at the Berkeley Center and at Georgetown and at other places about what makes for faith affecting politics in good ways, towards the good, towards the just. What are the challenges to that? And while putting together this conversation, there was a small editorial in Christianity Today, <laughs> which occasioned an opportunity to have a broader conversation and Melissa as much as we push to have the book be the focus of the conversation, Melissa, always deferential, always capacious, asked that we broaden the conversation to the themes around the book, the themes that also are invoked by other faithful in American public life. So while I'm over in the corner, the wonderful and esteemed panel that we have assembled today to have this conversation will be led by E.J. Dion, who is a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center. This is a long title. Is a university professor in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture, who teaches across the university, but primarily in McCourt and the Department of Government. And is also simultaneously, writes a small column in the Washington Post. <laughs> And also simultaneously as holds the William H. Bloomberg visiting professor at Harvard Divinity School and Harvard Kennedy School. Please stop because your title is getting too long for these events. <laughs> Ted Olson serves as Christianity Today's editorial director, overseeing all of the day-to-day -day operations for the magazine and website. We're delighted to have him uh, visit with us from um, Chicago. Reverend Adam Russell Taylor is the executive director of Sojourners and author of Mobilizing Hope, Faith-Inspired Activism for a Post-Civil Rights Generation. And Melissa, Melissa Rogers is a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. She previously served as special assistant to Pre President Obama and as executive director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And she's the author of the book faith in American public life, among many others. Um, two notes, immediately following this conversation, there will be a reception out in the president's room and a book signing. So if anybody would like to have uh, their book signed, we also have copies of the book available for purchase um, through the bookstore. Please turn off your cell phone noise making devices um, so that there aren't any um, rings. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to EJ. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to turn off my cell phone. Thank you for that <laughs> reminder. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to say that uh, during when the Great Recession started and unemployment was rising, a friend looked at me and said, what kind of liberal are you? There were all these unemployed people, and you have three jobs. And I felt <laughs> properly chastised. But, uh, one of the things I'm proudest of is to be associated with this great university. Another thing I'm proudest of is to be Melissa Rogers' friend, and we have worked together for 20 years now. Um, I show it, she doesn't. Um, and I am here out of uh, love, admiration, and also for enlightenment. Um, I could say a lot about Melissa, but I'll just say a couple of things. 
first, you should buy this book. <laughs> uh, Michael, as is always the case, was ahead, a step ahead of me because I was going to say faith in American public life is a great title for a moment, for this moment, given what is going on down the street, not all that uh, far from here. <laughs> Um, and I actually do think the book is about faith in our politics and public life, but underlying it is really a book about how we can have faith uh, in our public life. Secondly, I've, I admire Melissa for many reasons, but one of them is the work she did in President Obama's faith-based office. And there are some people in the room who worked uh, with Melissa What's really striking about Melissa is her capacity to hold strong convictions and also have a sympathetic understanding for views that she, in some cases, is utterly opposed to. Um, and in a field where there is so much discord, um, my friend Ramesh Panuru, the conservative writer, once said that in politics, no one is nastier to each other than religious people, and particularly Christian to Christian. Uh, and so this is a very difficult terrain, full of landmines. And Melissa stepped around them uh, through a capacity for empathy. And it was really a remarkable gift, both to our country uh, and certainly to President Obama. There was a period when she wanted to leave, and they wouldn't let her go. I, I think I can now reveal uh, that. Um, in fact, I don't think you left till the very last day of the, uh, of the administration. Um, but the other thing I'll underscore, and then I'm just going to ask Melissa to talk about this, is Melissa has been committed to religious liberty her entire life. She served, among other jobs, she served as general counsel to the Baptist Joint Committee. I always say that in our friendship, she made me a little more Baptist. I like to think I made her a little bit Catholic. Uh, and um, religious liberty did not start as a slogan for Melissa. It came from a deep understanding of what the First Amendment demands. Um, and one of the many things I have learned from Melissa, and I have often asked this question of my students, are the two halves of the First Amendment reinforcing, or are they intention, or both? Uh, probably the right answer is both. Um, but Melissa has found herself allied with all kinds of people on behalf of religious liberty because she takes seriously both the demand that, they are, that Congress shall make no law affecting um, uh, religion, uh, religious establishment, but also the free exercise clause uh, of the First Amendment. They are both important. And that's, kind of, that's really what I'd love you to start talking about in the context of our politics. But I'll frame the question in a somewhat more pointed way. How have we gone from religious liberty as what ought to be a unifying cause for all of us into religious liberty used as an ideological slogan to speak often for a rather narrow political agenda. And again, I can't underscore enough what an honor it is to be with Melissa or to have her as my friend. Melissa. Thank you, thank you so much. And thanks to EJ for his friendship. It's true. He's made me a little, little Catholic, and I've maybe made him a little bit Baptist. That's absolutely true. And it's appropriate to say here, of course. And um, I want to thank my friends and, and colleagues, Sean Casey, Michael Kessler. Sean and I uh, worked together in the Obama administration, have some other colleagues here. Uh, but we'd known each other previously. But it was such an honor to be able to work with him, leading Sean Led, as many of you know, the Religion and Governmental Affairs Office at the State Department. Very, a very distinguished manner, and it's a privilege to continue to work with him and Michael and all the Berkeley Center uh, staff who are so terrific. And um, also, especially to be here with Ted and with Adam, who are friends and colleagues who I deeply respect. And um, so, yes, and all, with all of you, so many friends, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So how did we, how did we get here? That's a great question to start off with, and, and it has been... Um, 
a, a sadness to me that things have become more frayed over time. I know uh, Adam's a little younger, but Ted and I are, are old enough to remember, at least, um, Ted, you want to compare notes with you on this, but I started work here in, the, in Washington, D.C. when President Clinton was uh, in, the, in the White House, and so that'll date me. But I remember at the time thinking, oh man, we are, you know, there's so many culture war battles. Surely this is the nadir of, you know, of the religious liberty debate. Oh, well, I was wrong about that, unfortunately. And things have only become more frayed, I'm afraid. Uh, and so how did we get here? Well, it's a very complex question. I'll only begin to start answering it. But I think that we have always had divisions over what is a governmental establishment of religion. Um, there's always been common ground about not preferring one religion over another, at least among most. But what does it actually mean for the government to establish a religion in violation of the Constitution? We've always had disagreements about that, but yet we were able, in somewhat because of our ties over free exercise issues, to nonetheless come together. For example, on President Cl the issue, the guidance that was issued during the Clinton presidency on religious expression and exercise in American public schools. You had everyone from the ACLU to the Christian Legal Society to the American Center for Law and Justice coming together not around what the law should be, that would be too difficult to agree on, but we could agree on what the law was and there was enough goodwill that we were all willing to sit down at the table and work together. And part of that was because we agreed on a lot of free exercise issues. And I won't go into all the details, but um, you know, after the Supreme Court's decision in Employment Division versus Smith, radically lowering the standards for protection for free exercise issues, we were able to come together around the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, for example, which boosted those protections as a matter of statutory law and worked together in a, in a really stunning coalition. Um, since then, uh, you know, I think what has often happened is the efforts um, in the relig Religious Freedom Restoration Act area and beyond have become embroiled in uh, differences about um, religious liberty and LGBT equality and how those two values should interact and also about um, religious liberty claims and uh, reproductive rights claims. We've had lots of increasing debate, and indeed, to some extent, um, the I'll use the acronym RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, there's been a pushing, I, and I would say uh, most recently by Justice Alito at the Supreme Court, to read the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in a way that, that others of us who are part of the coalition feels go to, goes too far. And so, this, because we are dealing with the dignity of persons, the rights to equality and liberty, this has been a very sensitive and combustible area. And sometimes um, the religious freedom battles have looked like battering rams, as I think you said, you've said, EJ, against LGBTQ equality, um, against other parts of human dignity, and that has set up a very painful and poisonous dynamic. So it's a real um, uh, quandary that we find ourselves in and that we're trying, those of us who have all these relationships across lines are trying very hard to respect each other and to recognize the dignity of all human persons because that's the, the real root of this. We need to respect everyone and find ways for the rights of religious liberty to coexist with other key civil and human rights. That's the goal, we've got to get there. But boy, are we really suffering through a very divisive debate in our process of getting there. Let me ask um, Melissa one other question before I open it up, if I could. Um, and this is, you know, you and I have been doing work on this for a long time. And when you go back to the Bush years when the first faith-based office right. was set up in the White House, and we had different, in, in, and we, we didn't even agree on every every aspect of that, but we had... Um, certain critiques of that, but there was also a kind of openness to discussion with them, and we thought there were some things they had done right, some things they had done wrong. We did that paper together, right. and then uh, you went into the Obama administration first as chair of the, um, uh, advisory. the advisory council and then as head of the faith-based office. It seemed to me then, and I think to you, 
um, that we were on a path where we might actually find some consensus in the country around many of these issues. You know, the broad idea being that religious institutions have been essential to the work of charity and justice, uh, that, that there is a history of a cooperation between government and these institutions, but there was also a need to be concerned about religious liberty rights and not crossing certain lines, that there are certain things government can and should not do. And with Obama continuing and building on and reforming uh, all of those, uh, the reforms being important, uh, reforming uh, the Bush program, it seemed possible we could move forward. Um, that hasn't happened. Can you talk a bit about that why? And maybe in the process, you might tell folks a bit more, who, those who had, didn't work with you at the time, a bit more about what that work uh, entailed. Um, the question I won't ask her, although you can ask her in private, is what catastrophes did you save the Obama administration from in your time there? Because I always say that some of Melissa's great achievements are the things you never heard about because she prevented things from going off the rails. But go ahead. Uh. Yeah, so the, the faith-based work, as you've given a good introduction to that, and of course, the work, as we wrote in our report, actually pre far predated the Bush administration because you can go back and see in the Clinton administration partnerships, Father jo Joe Hakala from the Department of Housing and Urban Development running an office that was focused on uh, creating partnerships between faith-based organizations and other community organizations and the government to serve people in need. Whether those were government financial partnerships where money was passing hands or just, you know, fi non-financial partnerships, ways that we use, um, and I use that in the best sense of the word, um, faith-based and community leaders who are both in touch with government in a, in a very uh, thoughtful way and in touch with people who are suffering and need the help of government and play that middle person role by connecting the two and saying, you know what, there are benefits available and, and sitting down with kids in church basements and getting them to fill out FAFSA forms so that and mailing the forms and if those forms were not mailed think about how how different their lives would be think about how that's life changing so these partnerships pre-existed long pre-existed the bush administration and will far outlast all of us i think um, in the future but President Obama did want to pick up on that office because it won't surprise anybody who knows anything about him that he did, having been a community organizer in the south side of Chicago, uh, working with faith-based and community groups, and also being a professor of constitutional law and understanding that there was room that church state separated. by the way, in the basement of a Catholic church Absolutely. in his neighborhood, Absolutely. Uh, where many Baptist ministers su suspected he always was under suspicion on religious themes. He was suspected of being an agent for the Catholic Church in a predominantly <laughs> non-Catholic neighborhood. So, you know, it, 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 he, it, Job was his hero when it came to religion, I think. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it, it wasn't um, a surprise to anyone who knew him that he was going to continue this office, even though it was unusual for the president of a different party to continue the signature initiative of this, his predecessor. Um, but uh, he did so and, of course, put his own stamp on it in the ways that you describe. Um, and, you know, really, there are people in the, there's so many people in this room who work together, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, to make this partnership center work. I'm looking at David Beckman and John Carr over here, uh, who, who, who've worked in, and so many others of you, uh, Jason from the Franciscans, and so many of you. I can't call all your names, um, so I probably shouldn't start doing that. But, um, but uh, came together across lines to say, we can make these partnerships work. And while everybody who worked with us didn't vote for President Obama, they were there for us. And um, I know I saw a friend from World Vision earlier, uh, so many friends came together across party lines, across ideological difference, across differences about the relationship of church and state, and said, let's work together to help people in need because that's, that is the bullseye. The bullseye is serving people in need. That is the mission. 
the means is working with faith-based org community organizations to do so. So it's constitutionally supportable for, for that reason. And indeed, we, we've had so many great partnerships, and one I always comes to mind right away is the partnerships dealing with um, the Ebola virus that was such a serious thing that emerged in West Africa in 2014, and the way that uh, the President Obama immediately said, we've got to have the government, we've got, including the military, we've got to have humanitarian assistance, we've got to have doctors and medical people. We've also got to have faith-based and other groups at the table. And he immediately called for us to do that. We, everybody came. When I called them, they were there the next day, and we worked on ways to address this terrible Ebola virus. So a lot of good things happened. Um, unfortunately, um, I think that that good work hasn't always been continued um, in the way that we would like. And a recent development that I'm particularly um, upset about is that we worked during the Obama administration on some of the most difficult church state issues to find common ground. And indeed, President Obama didn't want, you know, wanted to find that common ground and to get that common ground into federal regulations, knowing he wasn't going to try to do everything in this area that he wanted to do. Um, but he wanted to make sure that we, on church state issues, we had our differences with others outside the White House on that, but he wanted to make sure that we sought f common ground and that we put that in regulations. And one of those uh, common ground areas was to notify social service beneficiaries of protections for their religious liberty. We want to protect the religious liberty of providers. We also want to protect the religious liberty of beneficiaries because they shouldn't have to be um, you know, lose their protections for their religious liberty just because they need federal assistance. And that was an area of great common ground. So we worked to put that in regulations. And um, also to note that if a, a beneficiary did not want to go to a religious provider, they could ask for help in going to a non-religious provider or a religious provider of another faith. I'm very sorry to say that President Trump struck those provisions with an executive order and then just, uh, I, I'm losing track of time, but it was the week last week or the week before that regulations were proposed that completely end this, this requirement of notifying beneficiaries of protections for their religious liberty. Now, I think it's very important to realize that um, you know, you can do this notification a variety of ways. The Obama administration did it one way, and the, the Trump administration has said it doesn't like how we did it. Well, my question is, okay, if you don't like how we do it, then why aren't you finding another way to notify beneficiaries of protections for their religious liberty instead of ending the notification? for uh, two beneficiaries of protection for their religious liberty. I think what's indefensible is ending the notification and the protections for religious liberty. Um, we should all be able to think about different ways it can be done, but it must be done because that is what a true commitment to religious liberty looks like, protecting religious liberty for all people and not just the people that we like or are better friends with. It has to be for everyone. Thank you. And we can continue that. And we, we are having Q&A, so we're anxious. There are a lot of issues that uh, I hope you all uh, will raise. Um, Ted, a lot of us have appreciated your witness. I was worried that if I, I tweeted uh, my admiration for your <laughs> recent editorial, which I worried would hurt you a lot more than it would help you. Um, but I wanted you to sort of first just bounce off some of the things uh, Melissa has said in some aspects uh, of the book. Um, but one of the things you wanted to talk about is um, changes in the evangelical world, um, some on the negative side in terms of politics, some, as you see it, on the positive side in terms of thinking, new thinking about church itself. So I'd love you to just take this conversation where uh, you wanted to, <clears throat> sure. to take it. And, you know, and perhaps you might for those who don't know what you did recently yeah. that got you a lot of sure. notice, you might just tell them. You bet. You bet. <laughs> um, yeah, I, going back to the question of, uh, you know, what happened. I mean, I, I was working at Christianity Today in, in, in the 90s uh, as well. Um, and there was a, a, an idea, I think, in a lot of some of those early efforts that one of the biggest problems was ignorance. You know, let's let's make a, a let's have a, 
a list of things that we can go in and give to school principals and say, like, here's, you know, maybe some of us think things should be differently, but here's the rules as they are, and you can't tell a kid, you know, that he can't, you know, do his report about, you know, Moses or whatever. Um, and that was, that was incredibly helpful, and there was a common ground uh, effort that was put together, you know, and I appreciate uh, Melissa's book uh, has a um, nice introduction section about the difference between common ground and compromise, uh, and I think that's uh, something that she has modeled uh, for her whole career. Um, but that idea that uh, we, can, <laughs> we can work together to address some of these issues of, of, uh, of ignorance first, um, and then those are, those are some of the easy things. And, and some of the edge cases, like, yeah, we'll disagree about those things, but there's so much to do first. Um, but I think that the issue is, uh, as we talked about the faith in public life, there is this kind of loss of faith, not just, I think, in faith in public life, but in institutions broadly about uh, in this life together and, and this question of um, it's gone from what can we build uh, to what can we use. Uh, there's a really helpful op-ed in the New York Times uh, last week uh, about this uh, way in which uh, institutions are being uh, used now largely for, as platforms. You know, what, how can I use uh, this institution uh, as a way to, um, you know, speak uh, and, and build my own personal brand uh, or, uh, or kind of emote uh, and kind of, you know, own the other side. Uh, I think that, that that we're seeing broadly. I mean, it, it's showing up in a very key way in our politics, and especially in our, uh, the way in which politics intersects with religion. But I see it everywhere. And there's this shift from um, where can we find common ground, what can we build, and what can, uh, what can we do together um, to a much more punitive, uh, um, how can I show that I'm more righteous uh, than, than those, those people uh, that I oppose. Uh, so from a love your enemy to, a, to an, an own your enemy uh, a, a approach. Um, and so um, we certainly, uh, we, I did turn this off, I apologize. Um, but the, uh, what, uh, what happened at Christianity Today was uh, my boss, who actually just <laughs> kind of in some ways on his way out the door, he retired uh, a few days after he wrote this editorial, uh, Mark Gell, but it was an editorial, I want to be clear, it was, it was, he was speaking for the magazine, uh, wrote what, one of many articles that we have written about uh, the Trump presidency uh, over time, and uh, r just raising questions about, it wasn't about, you know, election or, or what have you, uh, he came in uh, after the uh, uh, impeachment uh, vote and said, we should probably do something on this. And we said, you know, we have said many times we don't want Trump to take up all the, all the air in the room. Uh, we don't want to obsess. Uh, one of the ways in which we can be a uh, um, prophetic uh, voice is to not let this uh, dictate everything that we talk about every day. Um, but we also said every time we said that, that that doesn't mean we're never going to talk about Trump. Uh, so it seems like impeachment day is probably a good time to do that if you're ever going to do it. <laughs> So, uh, so we had done a number of pieces before, and, and we expected to get some feedback. But I think a number of aspects, including it being uh, somewhat of a slow news day, um, elevated that. But to say to say to our uh, to our readers, um, look, we understand uh, elections are, are difficult things and, and come to prudential judgments. But the uh, unequivocal um, defend at at uh, at any cost and rallying. Uh, and deny, denying of, of issues of, of immorality and injustice, and um, and you know encouraging uh, the opposite of love of your neighbor um, is is unacceptable for for Christian behavior. Um, so a lot of people were a number of our readers were upset by that, but I think uh, more than that, a lot of people said you know thank you uh, for saying this and and. Uh, Kind of hoping that there's uh, more Christian leaders who will uh, find find that voice to 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 speak even even uh, while acknowledging that elections are difficult things uh, that happen. Which is a perfect segue to what Adam wanted to talk about: essentially how faith affects politics, how it should and how it shouldn't. I was thinking one way to ask. 
the question is, how did we go from what would Jesus do to what and whom would Jesus hate, uh, which is kind of seems to be the dominant theme on certain parts of our politics right now. Adam, it's great to have you here, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's a dangerous moment when Christians are known more for what we're against than what we're for, or who we hate versus who we love. Uh, what, first, I want to thank you, EJ, EJ, for your long commentary for the common good. I mean, that's what I really see you write about week in and week out. I want to thank Melissa for this book. Um, one of my side gigs, in addition to being executive director of Sojourners, is I teach a course on religion and politics at Pepperdine. I don't get to go out to Malibu, unfortunately, but they have a campus here in DC, and you've given me a great textbook, so it made my job a lot easier. And, and thank you, Ted, for really the prophetic witness of Christianity Today. I feel like you kind of understated how important and significant that was. We'll see what the reverberations are across the evangelical church and beyond, but I think you gave courage and cover for a lot of evangelicals who have been deeply distressed but what they've been seeing in the White House and by Trumpism more broadly. And I hope and pray that they will have the courage to speak out more and preach and teach about how they really feel. Um, we as a nation recently celebrated the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. So I think it's kind of fitting to start with a quote. And for anyone that knows me, I am often quoting Dr. King. Um, grateful that we share the same Baptist denomination, the Progressive National Baptist. We're actually members of the same Black Fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. So lots of things that we, we get to share. But he gave a quote that I think is still one of the most significant and profound quotes about the proper role of faith in public life. And in particular, how we as Christians or people of any faith really should be engaging in our political system. He said that the church, although I think you could actually replace church with synagogue or, or with mosque, but he said the church at its best is not called to be the master or the servant of the state, but to be the conscience of the state. And I think one of the real dangerous trends that we've seen is that we have a kind of Constantinian moment where because of almost unconditional support by one stream of the religious, well, the religious right, but one stream of predominantly white evangelical Christianity in support of this president and the kind of ways in which they have, I would argue, formed a Faustian bargain with this president, seeing certain policies being promoted, but ignoring so much of his immorality, so much of his undermining of our democracy, so much of his narcissism, his pathological lying, and many other things, that it is not only threatening the witness of the church, but it's also damaging faith in public life. And I think it's actually the original mistake the religious right made when it was founded. Many of us might think that it was founded around the issue of abortion, but really, many of you in this room know the galvanizing issue was around the forcing by the federal government of Christian colleges to desegregate after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And it was really a case of Bob Jones University that was kind of the clinching moment that inspired Jerry Falwell Jr. to form a political agreement with operatives in the Republican Party that gave birth to the religious right. And so the seeds of that movement really showed kind of, were a kind of precursor to what we are seeing and experiencing today. And so we, we can't be the master of the, of the state, but we also can't become the servant of the state. Um, also grateful that John Carr is here, and I've learned a lot from Catholic social teaching. I'm a Baptist through and through, but I have learned from lots of different parts of the Christian tradition and, and teachings. But there's a document that came out many years ago called Faithful Citizenship, and I bet you, John, you could recite it by memory. But in it, there are a series of principles that I John often... John the good parts. He could, yeah. Well, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some principles in there that I think are still extremely helpful and relevant for all of us that are trying to make these prudential judgments mm -hmm. about how to put our faith into the public realm, who to vote for. Unfortunately, the kingdom of God is never on the ballot and will never be on the ballot entirely. Right. Exactly. But in it, they say, we need to be engaged but never used political but never partisan, principled but never ideological, and firm but always civil. Now, it's, you know, these are all easier to just rattle off than to actually put into practice, but I think they should be what we should be teaching, not just in Catholic churches, but in Baptist churches and evangelical churches and in many different religious institutions about how we can really become that conscience. And I, I would argue that 
our nation in this moment desperately needs that conscience because we are experiencing a moment where not only is our democracy at stake and kind of under attack, but again, the witness of the church is being jeopardized and being undermined. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate in your statement, the Christianity Today statement, is that it talked about how one of the reasons that we need to speak out against Trump and Trumpism is that the kind of equation of Christianity or evangelicalism with, a Trump, with Trumpism is a major force that is driving people away from the church, particularly young people. We are now at a moment for the first time where the millennial generation is more religiously unaffiliated than they are uh, connected to a church or, or Christian. And so this trend is only gonna accelerate unless we rehabilitate the brand of Christianity and we become more faithful in following Christ. A, a couple of things. One is there are many avenues, if we were just talking about Melissa's book, there are many avenues we could pursue. I do wanna just point out that obviously we've already talked about uh, uh, religious expression on government property, government partnerships with faith-based organizations. Uh, she writes very well about faith and federal funds and what the government can and can't do in those circumstances. Also, an important distinction, which we will not go through here, although someone is free to ask, the distinction between exemptions and accommodations that is a really actually a very interesting part of the argument, the arguments we are having. And that's a case where if we could only get that distinction straight, we might uh, actually have more productive arguments. She also talks about faith in the workplace and religious discrimination and hate crimes. And I just wanna mention that a mutual friend of ours, David Hempton, who's the dean of the Harvard Divinity School, recently gave a great speech on religious liberty. And he begins by saying, well, this is not my area, and then proceeds, <laughs> like all humble people remember, you know, Sam Irvin, I'm just a country lawyer, really makes some wonderful distinctions. But what's really striking about it and what's central in Melissa's book is when we talk about religious liberty, why are we not talking more about religious oppression and discrimination and what is happening to Muslims and what is happening to other religious minorities in our country? David is from Northern Ireland, and he notes that his attitudes are very much inflected by a desire to uh, not for, for people not to get into the situations that existed for the people of Northern Ireland. So these are so there's a lot of we could be here for three hours, and instead of all of that, although Melissa, any of that you want to talk about, even just a good lecture on accommodations and exemptions would be great. I want to go down the panel and ask this question, uh, which really plays off uh, what each of you has said in different ways. Um, we talk a lot about polarization in our country right now. Um, it strikes me that in the religious sphere, we have seen enormous amounts of polarization for a lot of reasons, but I would sort of focus and ask you perhaps to focus on one of them, which is, you have had simultaneously the rise of a kind of Christian nationalism, and partly as a backlash to that, but also as something that was going on in the society anyway, a rise of secularization and of active opposition to impatience with, uh, in some cases, hostility toward uh, religion. You also simply have a rise of religious indifference and people breaking away. All of the numbers in the surveys about young people more and more disaffiliating themselves from any uh, religious institutions. Numbers at a level that we have never seen in our history since we've been polling. Could you talk about, uh, starting with you, Melissa, that kind of polarization and you know, some of it's a chicken and egg question, yeah. uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, thank you, EJ. Um, they, since I've already mentioned some concerns, I think that may emanate more from the left-hand side, and I, I don't, th I, the labels are, are vexed because they don't map well in this area, but, um, but for a shorthand, I've already mentioned some concerns coming from the left-hand side. Let me mention a, uh, some concerns that uh, I think that has come or are at the hand of people more on the left, this, the secularization that can run into trouble um, sometimes in being um, intolerant itself. And um, so, you know, I think from 
on and sec, there are many secular friends with whom I've worked and worked with secular organizations that are intentionally secular at the White House to serve people in need. So this is not to be said of everybody who belongs to an avowedly secular organization. But I think sometimes on the left in progressive circles, you will see um, a kind of an underprotection and a hostility toward free exercise and um, a uh, you know just a grudgingness um, where. There's not a willingness to take um, religious exercise seriously, uh, an unwillingness to, or I would say, a, a knee-jerk reaction of presuming that certain free exercise claims are insincere and just a cloak for hatred, um, which is not the case um, in many, in most cases. Um, and so we see that. We also see sometimes on on the left a sort of presumption that we we on the left will define intolerance and then we will use our state power to eradicate it entirely from society, which is not you know how we work in this country. Um, we we don't use the state to totally wipe out everything we would consider to be intolerance. Um, also, sometimes we see uh, politicians, and this actually happens on the right and the left, politicians telling people how to practice their faith and what they should believe as religious people. And that's not the government's role. It's not government's role to tell people that they need to change their religious beliefs or change their religious practices or practice them in this certain way, give attention to these issues and not those issues. Now, government surely can make policy that contradicts religious beliefs. That's, that's fine. They, in, in many instances, they can do that. They can and sometimes must deny religious exemptions. But it's just emphatically not the place of government officials to tell people that they have to change their religious beliefs and their practices. They can say, you have to comply with this civil law, but they shouldn't tell them that they have to change their faith. And I think, so those are some areas that I just toss on the table that can be problems coming, emanating more from the progressive side. Yeah, yeah I always say it wouldn't surprise the gospel writers that we're all hypocrites when it comes to religion, which is we love religious institutions yeah. when they are on us. our side, <laughs> and we really yeah. can't stand them when they're on the other side. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Exactly, no, that's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, the rise of Christian nationalism has been has been extremely mystifying uh, from from where we're sitting at Christianity today, because all the all the trends were pointing toward uh, much greater international uh, international uh, attention uh, for evangelicals, and, and part of that's the split between uh, the religious right and and kind of mainstream evangelicalism, or, or and Christian nationalism being kind of its own uh, world, similar to kind of a prosperity gospel uh, version. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I remember doing a number of articles on kind of the international religious freedom focus uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And one of the reasons that a lot of the uh, evangelical organizations were so excited about that was they saw religious freedom as one of these things that so many Christians could rally around, but that would also connect them with uh, fellow believers outside and really have this emphasis of we are a global body uh, of Christians that, uh, in, a, in a community that transcends kind of this, this nationalism, right? that transcends these national concerns. And you know, uh, evangelicals have been pretty involved in international global development and aid um, for a long time. And to see kind of this uh, this counter trend, um, uh, the the isolationism, the like, let's close the borders, the the amazing um, change of attitudes among a number of of, of people, uh, Christians towards refugees in particular, has been. Um, Something that we're really still trying to get our, our heads around at, at, at the magazine. I do think that one of them is just, I mean, I hate it. I honestly and truly hate it when things are reduced to fear. You know, I think that's kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction to like, oh, you're just afraid of this. That, that's the excuse for, you, must, you disagree with me because you're afraid of whatever. But I do think a lot, a lot of the letters that we got in response to our editorial saying that, that Trump should be removed from office did explicitly say Trump is the only hope we have left against 
what the liberals would do to us. Um, and I had one that, uh, that was you know, extreme, but I was grateful the person kind of was explicit with what they were feeling. And they, the person said, uh, you know, what, uh, Trump is the only defense we have left against the liberals. Jesus isn't doing anything. Uh, and I, I got back to them. I'm like, this, surely this is a, someone trying to troll me. Um, but I had a conversation, and it, the guy was dead serious. And to have someone be kind of open with their idolatry was, um, was uh, helpful uh, and heartbreaking at the same time. Um, and so I think uh, the difficulty in uh, calling people back um, to put not your trust in princes, uh, as, as the Bible commands, um, is, is one of the things that, that we feel like we have, have a, a strong call to do. And I would say that's not just with a, a Trumpist um, approach. I think that uh, there's, there's an echo of that in the number of people who, who, who wrote to us and said, um, you know, I, I had trusted all of these uh, Christian leaders when during the Clinton administration, the Clinton impeachment, they had said, you know, character matters and, and, and character is of prime importance uh, for, for political leadership. And now they're saying exactly the opposite. And now if they were, if they didn't believe that when they said it, you know, what else didn't they, what else were they just using? You know, what, what else did they not really believe? Those also extremely heartbreaking letters to receive and to read. Um, but there's an element there of that I, ha I, put, I put trust in princes. And you know, Christian, Christian leadership is going to let you down every time, too. Um, and I think I am praying for disillusionment in the same way that that's what prophets did. They, just, they said, look, this thing that you're hoping for is going to fail and it's going to break. Uh, and so if you don't have your trust in the right place, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're going to flounder and you're going to put your faith in idols. So that's my, my thoughts. Adam, I, I appreciated your underscoring the history of religion and race uh, in the country. I, I don't think he'll mind. He's uh, my, our friend, a friend of many of ours, Robbie Jones, has a fascinating book coming out on religion and race. I think it's called White Too Long. And he's white, and he said, I grew up in a denomination that believed that chattel slavery was, uh, it was advanced by, approved by the gospel. Um, and that we have had this split. Mark Knoll has written powerfully about the split around race and bigotry. It seems to me part of the problem we're having now is the difference between seeing Christianity as a call to righteous action and Christianity as an identity to be defended. And that when it becomes an, it's often that it's not a long stretch from Christianity as to be as an identity to be defended to white Christianity as an identity to be defended, especially at a time when our country is becoming more diverse over, you know, has become, will become uh, more diverse religiously and racially. Could you talk about that? Because it's a, it's, 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 I think it's near the heart of the, the, uh, the problem we're facing. And actually, this is a huge problem for, I'll say, we'll just stick with Christianity, for the churches themselves uh, at this moment in our history. Uh, yeah, thank you. So George Bernard Shaw once said that God made us in his image, God's image, so we return the favor. And I think, unfortunately, getting back to your <laughs> idolatry point, I think there's a lot of white Christians who have often been more culturally white than theologically Christian. And some of that stems all the way back to the Southern strategy and even further back than that, of course. But there has been a deliberate strategy to try to stoke the anxiety and the grievance of whites, particularly in the South, as a political strategy to draw them into the Republican Party. And I, I would argue, and I think that Robbie's research, which is really excellent, would substantiate this claim that the biggest fault line in our politics is still race, and you can't disconnect that from religion, and that one of the biggest wedges in the last election was the degree to which many white Christians, particularly in the Midwest and the South, but other places too, became more and more afraid of this demographic 
transformation that is taking place around us. And Trump certainly was able to speak to that in a way that did stoke fear, did stoke anxiety. And of course, there were, there were economic anxieties built into that as well. But the, this, the polling is pretty stark in terms of the degree to which the appeals to xenophobia and to the kind of fear of whites being in the minority in 20 years wasn't just something that many white Christians ignored. It actually is something that inspired them to support Trump in the first place. And so I just think we have to be honest about that and really figure out how do we address that from a theological perspective, from a spiritual perspective. I just want to go back a little bit to your comment about white nationalism because that was central to the founding of Sojourners almost 50 years ago. Right. We were founded by four seminary students, one of which is Jim Wallace, and he's still president of Sojourners. And literally the first issue, so Sojourners used to be called the Post-American, and then we sojourned and became Sojourners. But in that first issue, it literally had a picture of Jesus wrapped around the American flag with the cross. And this kind of fusion of nationalism with Christianity has been with us a long time, and now we're seeing an evolved version of it that really is quite dangerous. I think if anyone, if you have not listened to Trump's speech about two weeks ago when Evangelicals for Trump was launched at a megachurch, Latino megachurch in Miami, you should, because it was deeply, deeply alarming. He essentially said that God is on my side, God must be on my side, exact opposite of the words of Lincoln, and similar to what you just shared, that if this country or you elect Democrats, they will destroy your faith. I mean, that is heresy, that is apostasy. And we as Christians should be naming it as such. And yet, you know, I haven't seen a huge degree of outcry around that. Certainly Sojourners are speaking out about it and Christianity will, today will speak out about it, but I'm hoping many others will as well. Could I just throw right back at you and then do we, who's got a mic here? Is somebody um, got a mic? If you could bring, uh, let me, I'll ask a question, but let me have a, the first hand so you can have the mic as soon as I ask this question. Who wants to, uh, the gentleman over there. Let me just throw back at you where Melissa began the question. Let's also ask, what have liberals done, progressives done? And I say that as one of them. Um, one of them. Uh, what, have the, what have liberals and progressives done to encourage some of this anger, paranoia, fear, worry? How would you answer that question? Because I, I, I share, obviously, I'm very sympathetic to every word you just said, and yet I do worry about are there ways in which we have fed this anxiety rather than alleviate it? Yeah, so I mean, I do think that there is and has been a kind of secular fundamentalism within many strains of the Democratic Party and in many parts of the left. And that has been kind of hostile to religion, which then just feeds into this narrative that you know, the left is anti-religion, which I don't think is actually true. I mean, the irony, at least from a political perspective, a party perspective, is the most religious constituency yes. in the country is black women. And they are, you know, heavily Democrat, probably the most loyal Democratic voting bloc. 94%. There you go, exactly. And 97% <laughs> of them go to church. Uh, our churches would be empty without them. Right. At least my church would be. So <laughs> you have this kind of contradiction where you've got the most heavily yeah. religious constituency, and yet... The Democratic Party still has a kind of uh, ambivalence toward faith. And some would even argue it's more of a hostility. It depends on the candidate and it depends on the moment. I think the Clinton campaign had an abysmal religious outreach strategy and was way overly strident when it came to their posi his, her position on abortion. She completely abandoned the kind of rhetoric and commitment to make abortions legal, safe, and rare. And there was pushback from the kind of pro-choice lobby to try to convince her not to use that, that language in the context of the campaign. And there are lots of reasons why she lost, but it's, I think, kind of striking that uh, President Clinton gave an interview afterward, and he named that stance as the single most re important factor that led Hillary Clinton from, to, to lose in Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, and in other key states. So, so there's no question that there are ways in which the left's some oftentimes overly strident position on abortion and kind of unwillingness to listen to a pro-life perspective and kind of respect that perspective, I think that's been problematic. I think that 
you know, some of the ignoring of religion or overly kind of caricaturing religion has also been very problematic. Um, and, you know, one thing I actually really respect about the work that Melissa did in the Obama administration is that you really engage and listen to many different voices. And, you know, the, the, if the, you know we kind of resist these categories of religious left as a, as a kind of response to the religious right, but more progressive religious voices did push the, the Obama administration on a lot of different issues, particularly around immigration. And so there really was some robust debate and robust pushing back and forth. I don't see that on the side of the right with President Trump now, maybe in part because he demands absolute loyalty, but also because I feel like they have, again, made this Faustian bargain and given up their ability to hold them account, him accountable to things they disagree with. All the, all the black and blue marks have gone away since uh, the, the, not the, the <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Thank you. Uh, do you know of any discussion about the probability of forming a, a Bible-based, constitution-adhering political party? I mean, it seems that many Christians think that God backs one of the major candidates in, in every election, not understanding that God may not have a horse in that race. Uh, <laughs> like the 2016 presidential race seemed to me between an unpleasant socialists and a crazy fascist. And it may have been God just saying, you get to pick your poison. <laughs> you know, but there seemed to be this binary idea that, well, God has to be on one side or the other. And it's obviously going to be one of the two major parties, not be a minority party. But uh, what do you think about the possibility? And is there any discussion going on about forming a minority party adhering to the New Testament as well as adhering to the Constitution? And, and I say minority because don't ever expect the narrow way to be the broad way. Mm -hmm. And I understand that it's going to go against many politicians that are going to be valuing being, having might more than being right. But is there any discussion in, in, in your circles about some Christian kind of party? Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> I was going to look at dad. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, so the... I've, I've got a lot of emails that are, if I tried to reply to them, they'd be dead from people that have tried to start them. Um, but, uh, and, you know, it, it's been a long frustration. I mean, Mark Knoll, you brought Mark Knoll recently. He had a piece, I think it was, was it the 96 election, 2000 election, where he wrote a piece in the Christian Century about how he had stopped long ago voting in presidential elections. Um, and uh, one of the things I appreciate about this book and, and just about um, a, a broadened uh, discussion of faith in public life is the expansion of, of all the different ways in which Christians can, can politically engage and can work um, in some of the ways you're talking about uh, whatever, whatever 365 times 4 days of the year uh, is other than, other than on presidential election day. Um, and I, one, of, one of my laments is how much the Christian political conversation has been reduced to um, how, how are you going to vote. Um, and that, it's amazing how many, how many articles we write in CT that, are, that don't mention voting at all. Um, we said... <laughs> We said Trump should be removed from office, but it was not an, it was not an editorial about, about, the, uh, about the election. Uh, when, when we wrote it, we were thinking, like, well, that, that wouldn't mean that Mike Pence would be president, and our people, all these writers are against that? That seems a little bit weird to us. Um, but, um, but yeah, there, it's just politics is so big, and the, uh, the, the, the ability, and you know, American public life is, is even bigger. Uh, and so I, I think that there is a lot of hope there to still work together between people who tend to vote Republican, people who tend to vote Democrat, and a heck of a lot of people that aren't, aren't voting in, in, in uh, presidential elections. Could I, I do want to throw to Melissa, if I could, because I think I, I, I just had a feeling, as you were asking, sir, that a Southern Baptist uh, piece of Melissa and Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptists came up in her and said, no, I don't think we want to go there. Um, and, you know, there are Christian Democratic parties in the world. Sometimes they've been corrupt, which should scare us. Sometimes they have been 
pretty prophetic. You know, the Eduardo, I was just in Chile. The Eduardo Frey government in the 90s was pretty reformist and interesting. It was an interesting movement. There, there have been. What's your take? It strikes yeah. me as out of character in our history yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons, but I just wanted the Baptist in you, you to you speak. You weren't wrong. You've known for too long. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that idea scares, sort of gets me um, a little scared uh, because, you know, we do see this history that uh, that EJ has talked of, and and I can't ima I can't imagine that this deepening the worrying trends that we're talking about not helpfully addressing them because of you know the confluence of religion and political power, um, and of course we could be here all night talking about how the Bible relates to that and what Jesus has to say about that, um, but. Uh, you know, and, and I also think of all my Baptist forebears, and including Pastor John Leland, who talked about the fondness of magistrates to foster Christianity has done it more harm than all the persecutions ever did. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, that was shortly. So, I mean, one, I think that the success of minority parties in our system is quite strained, but I also think the, 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 the way in which we embrace and value religious pluralism, or should, would make a Christian party very problematic. Yeah. I would argue the better way that we can engage is to try to transform both political parties yeah. according to a shared set of principles and priorities. Now, we're gonna disagree as, as Christians what exactly those should be, but at the very least, and this is some of the work that I have the privilege of getting to do with David Beckman and many other organizations through the Circle Protection, is to say, you know, Christ is pretty clear that he had a strong preference for the vulnerable, the weak, and the poor. And that should be the litmus test for how we evaluate politicians. Are they governing, are they leading in a way that is caring for, protecting the poor, the vulnerable, and the weak? Yeah. And Christians across the spectrum can and should be able to agree on that core principle, and then we can figure out the best way to see it lived out through public policy and through leadership. Yeah. I've always said I thought the church's job in politics is to make everybody feel guilty about something, <laughs> which probably just proves I am a Catholic. Yeah, Catholic. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and I should also say that as a Baptist and an American, you know, I believe that the constitu under our Constitution, there are no second-class faiths. Right. And so it's so important, and that has been such a huge factor when we have lived up to that principle in making our nation truly great. Um, that I, we want to hold fast to that. And I very much appreciate EJ mentioning earlier the, the great difficulties that we're having in people even being able to practice their faith without fear for their physical safety. Mm -hmm. That to me is the number one religious liberty concern that's facing our nation right now. And we've got to treat it as such. Yeah. Amen. Sir. So uh, I have a question. When uh, President Trump was first elected after the hang, hand wringing, a lot of people said we have our constitutional order, we have the rule of law, uh, we have all of these practices and social norms that are you know, institutionalized in our elected leadership, in the generals that he hired to run his cabinet, and so on and so forth. But we found within, I don't know, a year, a year and a half, that when those norms are swept aside or their guardians are fired, uh, people who are believers in norms and values, like Christians, uh, are at a big disadvantage in trying to counter, you know, the, the measures taken or proposed uh, by the president. And so the question is, in this environment in which, you know, those norms have been swept aside and the, and the one violating them is in charge and ha is on the front foot, what do we do? I definitely think we've got to find a way to resurrect those norms and to uh, institute them. You know, there's some projects now looking at how many of the norms need to actually be part of our law and policy and not just norms anymore, and that's an interesting conversation. Um, but I think we absolutely have to find a way to go back to these norms because having worked in government and seeing, you know, there's there's no administration is perfect. There's always things going on that you want to do better. But you know, there was there is a nobility to a lot of those norms. And when when people uh, sometimes who are Trump supporters are talking to me about the policies that they support, uh, I'm trying to listen to that. 
and I also often bring up that the presidency is about more than just policies that you like, even if you like all of his policies, which I think, you know, let's talk about that if, if we're having a Christian to Christian talk or even just American American to talk. But what about the president representing all the people of our country, both in the country and abroad? What about things like that? What about putting the interest of the nation before personal interest? What about exerting some kind of ethical and moral example for everybody, including our children? The presidency is just a multifaceted office. And simply because you agree with someone on a set of policies does not necessarily make them the best president of the United States. So I hope that by having more conversations and by putting this very much on the table as we move forward, that we'll reestablish a consensus in the country in favor of a lot of the norms that have been, have suffered um, in recent years. But I'm not underestimating how difficult that would be. I don't mean to put a, poly, be Pollyannish about it. I think it's gonna be very hard work. Yeah. Just, and uh, yeah. we don't have nearly <clears throat> enough people speaking out right now in a bipartisan way about the destruction of norms and what is that is doing to the moral example of our country. Um, we desperately need more people to speak out about that on both sides of the aisle. It's not happening right now the way it needs to, and we're going to have to have that happen to be successful. Just gonna... Before I see two hands, uh, three hands. Before I go to the, you, I would like to see there are students in the audience, and I want to see. I want to go to a student next, if I could. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh! I can't see you. Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Alicia Jones. I'm a master's student in the Center for Latin American Studies program right now, and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it, especially as a young person who's also a believer, trying to understand how to explicate myself to others in my own program about my beliefs, and so they so often feel that uh, the Christianity or Christians have mobilized or Trumpism and things like that explicate that there's a difference between just a political party and then just our own Christianity and beliefs and we are all individuals. And so that kind of brings me into my question about how do you recommend us come to people who are on the more progressive or the liberals who are those ardent um, liberals who feel honestly, I guess you could say oppressed by not just Trump and this administration or the the beliefs that have been spouted off that have often been hate, but just the the church in general. They've there's a we talked about race. That how do you respond to that in in uh, a way where you can keep your own values and your principles, but also be understanding? Go ahead. Well, thank you for the question. First, I mean I I think I like to. Or I try to remind some of my secular friends about the rich history of the church leading and inspiring and fueling so many progressive movements and causes. I and mean, the civil rights movements were the most obvious one. It was the engine, the spiritual engine of the civil rights movement. And I think we can't underestimate the degree to which the movement was so much anchored in faith that people gain their courage to go face the fire hoses and to go get arrested uh, after having worshiped in a church and being prayed up. And, and it's that whole rich tradition of fusing spiritual renewal and faith with social justice is a very important and powerful one. But there's also many other examples we could point to, the abolition movement, even many parts of the environmental movement started with deep spiritual and religious roots. Um, obviously go global and talk about the anti-apartheid struggle and many others. And so. I just think being able to communicate and, and talk about those concrete examples is really important. And certainly Sojourners is an organization that is trying to live into that even further, um, inspire Christians to put their faith into action around a range of different issues, from immigration to climate justice to protecting the vote. We're doing a huge initiative on voter protection because sadly we have gone backwards 
and are seeing an all out assault on the right to vote in many key states around the country that really could swing the election and create a stolen election. So when, I, when we talk about those things, I think that they inspire people and give a kind of different image and understanding of what Christians in politics can look like. Um, and again, we have, we have to be careful ourselves not to make the same mistakes that you know, many others have made yeah. in the process. Yeah, so far, oh, oh, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, just two quick notes on that. I absolutely agree about that. And right now, one of the things that I continually point um, people to is look what's happening on refugees and the activism around welcoming mm -hmm. refugees to our country. We've got World Relief leading yeah. that. We've got Catholics leading that. Um, we've got all kinds of great people, all God's children leading that together. But don't focus on the courageous leadership uh, that's happening there uh, that's really making a difference in our country. And the other thing is, I think uh, some progressives get real nervous about, well, once we start talking to people who are against us on LGBTQ equality and reproductive rights, where will that lead? And I always want to say to people, do, do three things. We don't, you know, progressives don't have to change who they are. Um, what we need to do is we need to listen to people. Listen and hear them to, to the extent that we can. Not change our positions necessarily, but listen and hear. Second thing is to give people who disagree with us due process in the policy making process. Let them be heard, give them notice, uh, make sure that they are part of our dialogue and treated fairly. And third, seek common ground. Now that doesn't mean you can't do things that aren't common ground, but look for the opportunities to do things that are common ground. Do those three things. You don't have to change your platform or anything like that necessarily. You do those three things meaningfully and sincerely, and that, that can help. Um, I have one more student, and then we had three folks here. I don't know when this is supposed to end. I could be here. I would like to listen to them all night, but I know we have at least three right here, but why don't you go next? Thank you. Sadly, I'm not actually a current student, but am an incredibly recent grad. That's good enough. <laughs> so it works. It. Yeah, that's <laughs> thank a, you. And thank you so much for all of your comments tonight. This has been a really insightful and great discussion um, to be a part of. And I've heard you mention at a variety of times uh, the role of theology and teaching in and outside of uh, religious institutions and kind of the variety of Christian denom denominations. And I'm really curious if you could just talk more about the role of those theological teachings in the rise of Christian nationalism, the religious right, and also really curious about this increasing distrust in institutions and what, how is that possibly connected to theology that is being taught? Thank you. You were clearly an excellent Thank student. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, so... There's the discouraging side that is, is definitely happening. I also, there is, I, it may be the trend and not the counter trend. Uh, and that is actually, um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, fairly conservative uh, evangelicals um, in, who have been in fairly conservative contexts getting more excited about church. There's a loss of faith in institutions, definitely. And there's people who, you know, there's a lot of people who identify as Christian who like never darken the door of a church. And, and that group tends to be a, a very problematic group. Um, but uh, I am seeing so many people say, finding, you know, in the 50s and 60s, if you're, if you're a Christian entrepreneur, like you tended to form a parachurch movement. If you cared about politics, you were going to form some sort of parachurch activist organization. I'm seeing so much more uh, in people in their, in their 20s and 30s and 40s these days saying, what can I do that's, that's based in the local church and trying to rethink through the church as um, my, fir you know, my first community uh, and, as the, and as the kingdom uh, that, is going, that is going to last. And that's... You know there, how that plays out is 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 myriad, but I do think it's a, a more helpful um, starting place than the uh, kind of burn it all down and let's just start over and like you know uh, attitude that you hear that we heard in the 50s and 60s uh, from a number of people who were like I don't trust the church so I'm going to start up my own evangelistic association um, to. Uh, to the political, I don't trust anything, so I'm, let's just, you know, drain the swamp. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by, by whether people are, you know, strong church Anglican types, 
which is a trend, or the Presby you know, the rise of conservative Presbyterians. But it, definitely, the Southern Baptists are more excited about church as church than I've ever seen in my, you know, uh, you know, 30 years at CT or whatever. Just a couple things quickly to build on that. So, I mean, one, I think at its best, the church should be this space, this place where people allow their faith to influence their politics and not, not the other way around, or at least primarily that, that direction. Right. And a space where you can have civil dialogue about tough issues, even the kind of wedge issues, and try to find, try to find common ground. Now, again, easier said than done, but at Sojourners, we are trying to develop some resources and tools for churches, yeah. particularly politically divided churches, to be able to do this exact thing. I, my pastor was actually on a much deserved sabbatical right now, Pastor Howard John Wesley. He, before he kind of preaches a, a controversial sermon, he says something that always is disarming. He says, you know, look, my job as pastor is not to persuade you to my point of view about this political issue. It is to get you to think more theologically and critically about this issue. And so that nuance, I think, is really important. And we need to see more of that happening. One, the trend, there's two trends that I'm a little bit worried about, though. I agree with, with Ted, you, we can't reduce our faith to politics. But we also cannot be apolitical. Right. And as a Baptist, I know some of my <laughs> brothers and sisters don't always agree with me on this point. And Alyssa and I have been in the right. trenches in trying to convince Baptists that separation of church and state does not mean you segregate your faith from public life. But I think it is, this is a moment where we have to be politically engaged. Because to not be engaged is to be complicit. And if Christ is Lord over every aspect of our lives, that includes our political yeah. life, right? Yeah. The other quick point is that I think theologically we've had an overly anthropological understanding of faith and, and, and theology and not enough of a sociological one. And what I mean by that is we often reduce politics to much more of an individualistic enterprise rather than a communal collective enterprise. So we have you know, a strong analysis about what charitable acts can do to help change lives and make a difference, but often ignore systemic and structural causes of injustice that so often perpetuate injustice. And so we have to ha develop a much sharper theological lens that sees systems and structures and is empowered to address those. Um, I want to go over here. I, I ju um, Father, I want to, if I can have a Jesuit preference <laughs> over here. Um, who's got the mic? Oh, you've got. Um, by the way, on your question, I was once on a panel with Ralph Reed, and I, obviously of the Christian Coalition, he and I had disagreements, <laughs> obviously that, but I said I will always <clears throat> defend Ralph's uh, base, rooting many of his political views in his religious commitments because my own religious faith has influenced my views, but he must explain to me where in the gospel he finds cuts in the capital gains tax because <laughs> I just can't find it in mine. Uh, Father. <laughs> I'm David Hollenbach. I'm here at Georgetown. And the author of my favorite concept in this sphere, which is intellectual solidarity, which everyone <laughs> should try to engage in, and I fail all the time, but I try. My, my question is really for Ms. R Ms. R Melissa Rogers, and it's about religious freedom. Okay. And you talk about, you know, how we're so deeply divided around some of these issues today. And I guess I'd like to ask you about how, how dangerous you think it is, this division. I mean, I'm thinking of a couple of extreme cases or cases that are, uh, could be regarded as extreme. I mean, when we got into the debate about the Little Sisters of the Poor case with denying uh, the coverage of contraceptives to the people who worked for the sisters. and But the, the, the attorneys, when they pushed it further, ultimately wanted to argue, and this didn't prevail, but they wanted to argue that the religious freedom of the Little Sisters of the Poor meant not only that they're, they shouldn't cover contraceptives for their employees, but that their insurance company shouldn't provide contraceptives for anybody whether they work for the sisters or not. And so they, what they were trying to do was implement their own ideas for everybody, not just to be free from interference. That's one side of it. Mm -hmm. That's the right wing. Mm -hmm. The left wing, the Equality Act that was passed in the US House of Representatives this past fall, which guarantees non-discrimination on a whole range of issues, including sexual orientation, 
It then went on and said, there will be no exceptions to this law on the grounds of religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not been implemented because it hasn't been passed by the Senate and so forth, but it's a sign on the left of saying, even if you believe deeply that there's a problem here with gay marriage, we're not gonna let you implement that in your own. So, I mean, that's a pretty wild split when you get those differences at that level. I'm wondering, I mean, we've got to move away from that kind of polarization, but I'm wondering how deep you think this problem is and how, uh, how worried should we be that we're going to lose religious freedom as one of the foundational principles of our society. And I mean, I'm worried about it, and I don't know how worried I should be. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm in this book. <laughs> yeah. I've read the book, but I'm interested oh, in yeah. seeing about yeah. how you would respond to yeah. my question about how how deep how do you how deep does this split go? Do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is a serious problem, and uh, but I'll, I'll try to offer some hopeful uh, comments as well. I, I objected to the initial Obama um, plan for the contraception mandate because I thought the exemption there was not adequate to the religious liberty concerns. At the same time, I have objected to the Trump administration's plan as overreaching on this. So I, you know, I think we're on the same page uh, there, uh, generally speaking. Um, and, and that's a problem. But I, I will note in that case that, um, that one president, President Obama, listened to the opposition and tried to come up with a plan that would honor concerns on both sides. Now, it wasn't acceptable to everybody, but that is notable. I don't know of any instance in which the current administration has heard a religious liberty complaint, like, for example, um, Scott Warren and his colleagues at the border who are providing humanitarian assistance to people in the deserts on the southwest border and have made a religious liberty claim. They're being prosecuted by the Trump administration. I don't know of any instance in which the Trump administration has listened to a claim coming from, you know, uh, cutting against their policy priorities and has stepped back and tried to find a better balance. So I, I, I think that that's, that should be noted. Um, on, on the, uh, I'll mention your other example and then try to go 20,000 foot again. I, I do think that we've seen, you know, introduction of the Equality Act. We've also seen introduction of what's called the Fairness for All Act, which does provide some exemptions for, um, and, and the Equality Act does too, although it says that there can't be any RIFRA exemptions, um, and so that's what's controversial about that part. My, my, uh, I applaud both sides for working for LGBT equality. I'm wondering if we can get those two groups of people together um, to try to come up with something that does advance uh, LGBT equality at the federal level, which we desperately need, and also protect religious liberty. This is exceedingly difficult, and it, it's a source of great sorrow for me, having worked in this area, to see it be this way. But I will tell you, just, just to give you a little hope, um, and I won't tell anybody's name, but um, I continue to reach out to people who, who, you know, we disagree on one thing, um, and then we agree on another, and we, we fight each other on something, other. We're, we're continually calling each other up and saying, what can you do here? What can I do here? Let's, let's see if we can get these people together. Right before I got into this meeting tonight, I was a little delayed because I got one of those phone calls from one of my friends saying, hey, you know we're going to disagree about all this, but you know that I'm with you on this. Can we do some good here? And, you know, I mean, I said a prayer, literally, thank God that you called because this is how we're going to get back to a better place if we continue those relationships, extend grace to one another, um, realizing being opponents on one issue does not make us enemies. It makes us potential collaborators on something else. And um, if we can pour more energy to that, blow those little embers into you know helpful flames, then that's how we'll get out of this quandary. I, I was gonna say at the end of that talk, uh, we will have petitions for Melissa's presidential campaign uh, in the back of the room. That was beautiful. I'm told we only got less than five minutes. Um, I know there were several hands here. Could I, uh, here's what I'd like to do if this is okay with you all is have everybody come in with their questions 
and then I will just go down the line and maybe start, I'll let Melissa close. Um, by the way, one parenthetical, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't misunderstood uh, because the Obama administration came up. Melissa didn't want to leave because she had any disagreements with them. She had a, a, a health issue at home and the Obama people wanted her to stay so much that they gave her all kinds of, as it were, accommodations <laughs> yeah. so she could be true to her family and still do work for them. But I just wanted to get that out there. Um, so the gentleman back, this gentleman has been very patient, so let's go to him. Uh, the gentleman back there, was that it? And, uh, and this gentleman. So if the three of you could ask a question, then this will make it easy for our panelists to evade whichever one they uh, <laughs> don't want to answer. But let's start with you, sir, and I bless you for your patience. Thank you very much. Um, Teilhard de Chardin may have say that, uh, Teilhard de Chardin may say that, um, that our diminishments are as important as our successes in the world. And of course, this is a huge diminishment. Um, but I'm thinking about um, the silver lining you know, like every hate group, every belligerent bully has raised their hand and said, here I am, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And they're being heard. They're being loved by having a president. They're, 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 in, they're in the third year of the administration. They're, they're in their glory right now. As I was in the Obama administration, I was felt very loved during that time. So is there some silver lining where there, this could be a reconciliation of some sort where people are feeling they're being heard, you know, the, the weak, the poor, the people that aren't usually heard in a bureaucratic administration, you know. So that's, I think, uh, an important issue, possibly. Bless you, I describe myself sometimes as a glass one-tenth full person, <laughs> but you do me way better yeah, with the hopefulness yeah. of that question. <laughs> Sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my name is Tobias Kramer. I'm a visiting fellow at the uh, Berkeley Center at the moment, oh, usually great. based uh, at Cambridge University. And my question, I think any of you can, uh, can, can speak to that. Uh, is basically we are speaking a lot about how the religious right uh, has brought Trump into power, about all the, the Faustian bargain as you talked about it. Uh, but actually one interesting trend that we talk about less often is that in particular during the primary, uh, Trump was actually made candidate not by the most fervent churchgoers, but actually had the most support among those, who, who, those Republican primary voters who don't go to church at all. He actually did double as well amongst those than amongst the most frequent churchgoers. And there are some studies that show that amongst, amongst Trump voters, churchgoers tend to be more moderate on things such as immigration and race than non-churchgoers. And being European and studying European right-wing populism as well, we actually see quite strong secular right-wing populism in Europe. Uh, if you look at France, the idea of laicity, etc. So we often have the idea that if only... Uh, religiosity goes away, we will be rid of all this right-wing populism. And I'm sometimes wondering, are we perhaps, should, should we worry about the religious right? Or should we also be worried about the post-religious right? Or should we maybe even be more worried about the post-religious right? Thank you. Thank you for that. And then it looked like it might be a joint question between the two of you, you were conferring. So <laughs> feel free to speak, both of you. So I'm Jacob Adams. I'm a uh, freshman at Georgetown. I'm also secretary of the College of Republicans here. Oh, okay. And so brave I, man. <laughs> thank you for yeah. thank you yeah, for no coming. Problem. Yeah. So I was going to ask. Um, we talked about like modeling behavior and stuff. And the March for Life is coming up tomorrow. And President Trump is actually going to address the crowd. And I believe it's the first time a president has ever actually done that. And so I was wondering, like. It's, I don't want to speak for all the college Republicans here, but we kind of take Trump as a, we like some of the stuff he does, we don't like some of the other stuff he does, but um, overall, like, this is something that we're really happy about, and so I was wondering, like, would you, would you disagree? Is that not modeling good behavior because of his other, you know, flaws as you may see them, or is that actually an example of modeling behavior that would be acceptable? Because I'm very pro-life. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't you, so if I could, we can start up the uh, for, uh, Adam and, and work our way to Melissa so she can be the last uh, voice. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. So I wish I was as hopeful. I mean, I am a Christian minister, so I'm kind of a prisoner of hope by vocation. <laughs> but I actually kind of agree with the Atlantic. We are in a cold civil war. We have not been this polarized as a nation since the 1960s. 
And I fear we are going to be choosing between a kind of politics of contempt and polarization or the politics of what I would describe as the beloved community. And I'm reflecting on that a lot because I'm writing a book about it and don't have time to go into all that right now. But I think we really do need a moral vision that is capable of uniting the majority of Americans around some shared and core civic and religious values. And I think we can. So I'm hopeful that we can. But I think in the moment we're right now, it really is going down the direction of a cold civil war that could actually turn into a much more open, violent civil war. Um, no question that there's lots of danger on the secular right. And we see that, as, obviously, as you mentioned, in Western Europe and certainly the United States. So I agree with your point, absolutely. I'm not an expert in all of those trends. I am deeply worried, though, you're right. The religious right uh, initially had other favorite candidates, but they've quickly fell in line. And yeah. they kind of allowed Trump or Trump, you know, Trumpism to become their kind of, they embraced it, essentially. And that deeply worries me. Um, you know, one of the interesting statistics that PRI has actually shown is that if you look at evangelical opinion about the importance of character and virtue in a president around the time of Clinton's impeachment, vast majority, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was like 80% said character is really, really important. Did the same poll, asked the same question after Trump got elected, and it was down to like 30% thought it was important. And so clearly something is happening there that I think we really need to pay attention to. Um, I just want to kind of close with, with one, one thought. And there's so much that we couldn't cover. You know, this really could be like a whole series. Uh, and so many of you in the audience should literally be up here as well, um, reflecting and talking. But I'm going to put on my professorial hat for a second, a little less of my activist executive director hat. I'm really fascinated, after having studied a lot more, the relationship of church and state and religious liberty in Germany, Australia, and the UK. And I do a comparative part of my class where I compare the US system to those countries. And what's interesting is, as you probably know, those are much more secular countries than here. And yet, they have a much higher comfort level in providing direct support to religious organizations in the delivery of social services. All three of those countries provide direct financing to religious schools. And that's a very you know, prominent issue right now in the, in, the, well, in the Montana Supreme Court. And so it makes me just kind of wonder whether there's things that we should be learning from those examples. We have a different political history. I'm not saying that we should change our core commitment to the separation of church and state. But I do think that we still have a ways to go in the context of this. And this is informed a little bit by, by my experience uh, leading the, uh, what was called the Faith Initiative of the World Bank, which built on a lot of great work that Catherine Marshall did um, through the world uh, a number of years ago. But religion does play such a central role in shaping people's worldview, in shaping their behavior. And it is nonsensical that governments, whether it's the US government or it's a uh, multilateral institution like the World Bank, wouldn't try hard to figure out how to partner with and to harness some of those unique contributions that religious actors already play within all, pretty much all facets of life. And so I think some good progress has been made, but we've also seen some stalling. And it's really important that we pay attention to how to build more effective partnerships. And I think some of these other countries have some lessons to offer. Yeah, absolutely. That's very good. Very well said. Um, I'm, I'm, fairly, I'm fairly hopeful. I think that there's a, uh, one of the things I really appreciate about this book, which, again, you should all uh, get and read, um, is the history, the vision, and the hope that it has for win-win uh, uh, solutions. To say, like, well, yeah, I mean, it's not like we weren't, it's not like there weren't divisions in, in you know, 96, 2000, 2004. Yes, there were, there were big divisions. Um, and it was not easy to find win-win solutions. You have to be committed to win-win solutions, um, but they're, they're there to be had. And I think you know, we, one of the things that we haven't mentioned at all, I mean, uh, criminal justice and like fa uh, religious freedom in prisons uh, is like a wide open area for there to be massive, there's massive issues there uh, and um, massive opportunities for some win-win solutions and some basic like even the basic, here are the rules um, uh, coming together and distributing that kind of thing that I'd, I'd love to see more, more people engaged in. 
um, on um, on the pro life activism. I you know I'm 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 with you on on I'm extremely pro life as well, and I I think that there's win win uh, solutions there. And where I'm eager is to see that discussion. Um, yeah, also expanded beyond like election day. And that's one of the things that I'm very, that actually I, I, I get excited about the, the March for Life because it represents something where it's beyond just the, you know, a Faustian bargain of like, um, you can do whatever you want uh, so long as, you know, um, I, 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 the, the deal is you will have my vote uh, in exchange, you know, uh, in exchange for this pro life rule. Um, I think what a thing like March for Life does is to say, if you're pro-life, it's something that is needs to be an everyday needs to be an everyday uh, thing, and uh, I hope one day it's there on the list of, of great social movements with uh, with many of the ones that Adam mentioned. So, Melissa, uh, just a couple of thoughts. I think you know one of the things that I have always respected so much about about Catholic social teaching is this. Um, seamless garment of life, and um, and so I guess I just hope that 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 can be lifted up always as the as the authentic voice of the of the pro life community to shine a light where, um, for example, this administration or any other is not living up to the consistent um, witness of of life for those who articulate that. Um, so we if we look at uh, we look at abortion issues. We also need to look at, you know, what's going on at the border, and we need to look at torture, and we need to look at, um, you know, other other things separating children from their families and all this kind of stuff. So I hope that that will be the kind of witness that comes out um, from the pro-life community. Um, the uh, and Adam just said that just to get me going, just to, uh, about religious liberty and how we should rethink it potentially on some issues. Um, I don't want to overdo what you said, but he, he really got me going. I, I won't I won't start it, but I will oh, say, <laughs> but I will say in my book, you know, it's I, I try to clarify that under the law currently there is really a robust role that religion can play in American public life. And indeed, um, especially in recent years, there has been a kind of a relaxing of the rules, the church state rules to allow more funding to flow mm -hmm. to religious entities. Um, so I hope that we would take a hard look at what all the opportunities that the Constitution creates for religion to play a robust role in American public life uh, before we take further steps. Because one of the things I'm worried about some of the further steps is that in order for religion to play that prophetic role or the conscience role that Martin Luther King described, it has to have some meaningful independence from the state. If it is, you know, being completely religion, being completely bankrolled by the state, we worry, I think, with good reason about whether religious voices will be willing to speak up and try to correct the government when it feels like it's going off yeah. course. So I think, you know, I'll join my, I put have in the book, uh, quoting Justice O'Connor, uh, when she, her swan song opinion on the court, when she looked around the world and say, said, um, you know, look at our own country. We have so much religious observance. It's religiously vital. Um, we look around the country and we see religion is often uh, a source of conflict in terms of violent conflict even. And, and she ended her opinion by saying of our own constitutional ideas and traditions, why would we want to tr trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? So not to, we, to be continued. Um, I, take your, I take your challenge, but um, I look forward being to- provocative, our, but yes. Yes, you're being provocative. I, I look forward to a more sure. debate about that. So. so I want to close in two ways. First, I just like to, I admire anybody who asks a question when they know they're probably a minority in the room. So I, I yeah. just want to give a quick answer uh, to that. Um, you know, Trump knows conservatives and Republicans are his political base. So he gives to cultural conservatives, he gives his position on, on life issues, shows up at the march. Uh, for business conservatives, he has the corporate tax cut. For some conservatives, that's enough. There are other conservatives who say, my, some of my friends, Pete Weiner, Mike Gerson, who say that Trump's abuses of power, his racism, his attitude toward immigration, his divisiveness, those actually, as it were, trump even the issues they agree on. I think 
there is a very lively debate among conservatives right now about which side of conservatism is right. It won't surprise you to know what my views are, but I think that is one of the most important debates in the country going on right now because the future of conservatism is actually very important to the future of the country. Now, to close, again, I want to reiterate, those of you who haven't gotten this book should get it. And one of the beautiful things about this book is how Melissa chooses to end it. And some of you in the room, many of you perhaps, know the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It's the theme, so it's become a kind of African-American national anthem. It was, it was the um, official song of the NAACP. And I just want us to close by asking Melissa to read the second stanza. Uh, you can read any one you want. I just think the second stanza's got a lot of punch in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could. But, I like it. Yeah, but go ahead. And then uh, we, and please join us afterward. Stony the road we trod, bitter the ch chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to this great panel. Thank you.